With the 2021-22 NHL season firmly in the books, we're going to look at some winners and some losers for the Los Angeles Kings on today's episode of Locked On Los Angeles Kings. You are Locked On Kings, your daily podcast on the Los Angeles Kings, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey everyone, happy Monday, happy 4th of the July, 4th of the July, if that's your thing. Uh, if not, yeah, happy Monday. You're listening to Locked On Los Angeles Kings, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. And today's show is brought to you by Bet Online. Uh, Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, it's where the game starts. We'll have some more about Bet Online later in the show today. But my name is Sarah, joined by Eddie here on the show on Locked on Kings as we uh, take a look at some winners and losers of the 2021 22 season. Losers is maybe too harsh of a word, uh, but we're going to look yeah. today. <laughs> and, uh, I, I think I think because of the success of the season, right. you have to, we're being very picky, I think, with some of these selections. Right. But that's okay. That's a good thing. <laughs> so we're going to look today at players who surprised us, who impressed us throughout the season with the Kings. Maybe some players who underwhelmed, who we kind of wanted to see a little bit more from. And then maybe take a look at some guys who we think are ready to kind of make that next jump up and uh, earn, earn our top honors for next season. Uh, for the Kings. So uh, we'll just start with who impressed us the most. And Eddie, I'll just go ahead and throw it right to you. Who's your uh, shining stars, I guess we could say, of, of of the Kings this year? Well, there's there's a couple of pretty easy ones to choose from. And uh, I, I have to say, it's really hard to pick between the between Adrian Kempe and Philip Deneau. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to go with Philip Deneau because of expectations. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I knew of his game. Um, talked to a lot of people about it before I saw him, you know, uh, uh, consistently over time. Because you, you know, you can't really judge by watching a game or two or watching highlights. You need to see these guys play day in and day out to really mm -hmm. get a grasp on what kind of players they are. And everything I heard about Philip Deneau was great all-around player, but he's not going to score. Mm -hmm. And for him to provide uh, uh, such a boost, uh, putting the puck in the net was such a welcome addition um you know he, you know providing some relief for Kopitar not having Kobe to, to you know carry the burden to have a, a legitimate number two center all those things were kind of expected but it, the goal scoring was was not expected and for him to make that such a big thing scoring a career high 27 goals uh and and as we've talked about a team that needed offense that still needs more offense going forward but mm -hmm. that kind of production uh, to go around, to go along with his all-around game was great, and and I mean you could also easily pick Adrian Kempe, who obviously had a breakout year, um, something that the Kings sorely needed, a, a top-line winger who they could rely on uh, to play with Andre Kopitar and be the finisher. And I thought going into last season that either Kempe or Ayafalo needed to step up and score at least twenty. Um, didn't know which one would do it. Uh, but obviously it was Kempe in a major way to be plus 19 in goals from his previous career high. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to, you know, we're talking about a full season, not any of the COVID uh, shortened seasons or what he was on pace for, uh, for any of that, but uh, plus 19 from his previous career high and to score in a lot of different ways. I mean, he wasn't just a sniper on the wing, although he had that. He has the breakaway speed. He would go to the net. He's mm -hmm. not afraid to go to the net. So the way he scored in such a variety of ways is another reason why I think it's not just a, a flash season for him. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I was thinking about this, and I don't know if I have anything to back it up, but when he went to the All-Star game and finished second in the fastest skater competition, I think it opened a lot of eyes. Now, I know mm -hmm. he was fast, but, but maybe to the hockey world and to himself to see – yeah, that he is an elite skater and has elite speed that ranks amongst the best of the best in the NHL. I wonder if that opened the eyes of some defensemen, maybe mm -hmm. gave him a little bit more room, mm -hmm. and opened his eyes as well as well, and gave him a little bit more confidence for that second yeah. half of the season as well. Yeah, and I, I think I mean just the, the All Star thing in general. You know, it, it's been kind of a given for however many years that 
You know, it's one of Kopitar, Dowdy, Quick, who goes to the All-Star game for the Kings. And I like the fact that they, you know, they they did not so much of a deep cut because Kempe has been having had a fantastic season. But, you know, he wasn't necessarily the obvious choice if you're looking from a like, who on this team do people know the name of kind of perspective. And yeah, I think that letting him have that experience and letting him you know, be in the room with the, you know, it's the all-star game. It's not necessarily the best of the best, but you know, it's, it's a chance to get kind of hyped up and yeah, that he got to see that, you know, kind of, kind of play out for him. And and I know the Kings have been for looking for a long time for someone who's in that kind of like mid twenties age range really to kind of start stepping up. Uh, and it's been that, that sort of lack of the next generation of guys to really, you know, step up and take ownership and take leadership and really step up their performance. And, you know, Kempe had that year. Uh, that, that was definitely, uh, he, he's a really good candidate for, you know, who was the biggest surprise on the team. Uh, for me, my biggest surprise this season was Trevor Moore, uh, who is, you know, I'm sure if someone gets really bored and wants to dig through however many hours of tape of Locked on King shows are out there, there's absolutely an episode where I watched a game with Trevor Moore and I said, I think I've seen enough of this guy. Like he just, it, it just, I was like, I don't know what, what we're doing here with you. Uh, and for whatever reason, it seemed like for him, everything clicked this season as well. They got him on a line that was really kind of playing to his strengths as being that sort of energy, weird setup kind of guy, uh, you know, got him with players who can finish plays, who can get pucks to him so he can finish plays um, and sort of filled that role of, you know, you're sort of middle six guy who, you know, again, like plays bigger than his size kind of. Uh, but but I was just really impressed with him in terms of what he put on the board in terms of scoring, in terms of, you know, those goals that, you know, I hate like, you know, clutch is, you know, you can't measure that. That's not a thing. But I felt like he was kind of the guy who you needed a goal and all of a sudden there's Trevor Moore like racing to the net and banging one in and they haven't always really had those guys in the lineup lately uh, and so he's definitely someone who I thought was um, just really impressive with the way that he grew from last season to this year. It's definitely not a bad choice at all and it goes to show you and I think Adrian Kempe is an example of that as well what players can do if they have stability. Kempe locked in on that right wing spot more locked in on that second line and getting a chance to play a full season. And now you have to earn your minutes. You can't just give them to someone. Um, but fortunately for both those guys, they got off to good starts. Uh, they were able to have a solid spot in the lineup, know who they're going to play with pretty much night in and night out. And I think that's, that's not a luxury. A lot of guys have, especially a guy like Trevor Moore who can move, you know, third line, fourth line. Uh, it, sometimes you don't know who you're going to be playing with. Uh, night in and night out, but th I think the stability of the lines mm -hmm. that they played on uh, certainly was a big factor in how they were able to be consistent and and have career years. Yeah, that stability is a really important point. I think that you know we can all look at games over the past couple seasons where you know the lines aren't the same from one game to the next game. They're constantly looking for someone to develop chemistry with someone instead of just letting it play out. Um, and, you know, I know that even if you listen to players, the players are like, yeah, it doesn't just happen automatically. We need we, we like knowing that we're going to play with these same two guys night in, night out. We're going to get a chance to make it work. And I, I like the fact that Todd McClellan didn't just hit, you know, the eject button. The second one game went bad, that he gave them all chances to really kind of hone in on that chemistry. And then, you know, knowing as well that when injuries happened or, you know, they just need to sh shake things up, they can. Uh, but that for the most part, we saw those kind of consistent pairings or lines. Yeah, I agree. Um, I I've always been a huge fan of coaches that try and let the players know where they're going to play and keep mm -hmm. the lines as consistent as possible. Sure. If you're having a, a stale night and you want to put the guys in the blender and mix it up for a night or two, I get that. Uh, and if there's a prolonged slump or a lull, mm -hmm then you have to obviously address that as well. But more often than not, I've always been a fan of letting players know who they're going to play with and where they're going to play night in and night out. And I just think that's so much more um, convenient for the players to know, you know where they stand, how many minutes they're going to get per night, who they're going to play with. It just, it just helps things across the board. And you know, there are some coaches who really love to mix it up and mm -hmm. kind of keep the players on their toes. And uh, there's something to be said for that, I think, on occasion. But I think consistently – 
I do like the job Tom McClellan did last year with those two lines in particular and letting those guys know and play together and, and get the chemistry and everything else. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, uh, there's been a lot of surprising performances and I think a lot of that is what helped kind of push the Kings into that playoff spot because a lot of guys really stepped up a notch this year. Uh, coming up next, we're going to talk about some players who may be underachieved, who didn't quite hit the highs that we wanted them to hit. Uh, we're going to talk about that coming up next on Locked on Kings. But before we get there, I want to remind you, of course, that BetOnline.net is your number one source for all your sports betting needs and information. No matter what sport it is that you're following, if you're into soccer, baseball, football, basketball, you know, if you're already getting ready to like place some bets on hockey, I'm sure you can go and uh, check out the odds for the next uh, next Stanley Cup. They're already out. Uh, believe it or not, you can find all of that on Bet Online. They're of course your continued source for all your sporting wagering information, including live betting, esports, and scores. And of course, it's the best spot for all of your scores, podcasts, and general sports news this season. BetOnline.net is the fastest and easiest way to check in on all of your favorite sports and events, including MMA, boxing, and even golf. So head over to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and the action. BetOnline, it's where the game starts. This is, of course, Locked On Los Angeles Kings. My name's Sarah. I'm joined by Eddie as we uh, take a look at some highs and some lows, some winners and some not quite winners from this past season with the Kings. Uh, we've looked at guys who surprised us this year. Next up, we're going to look at players who maybe didn't quite achieve as much as we would have hoped they would have uh, this season. So who is your uh, your number one wish we would have gotten more from them guy? Yeah, and like we said, I think for some of the players when I was looking at the roster, you could be extremely picky uh, with this, which is a great thing. But it's hard for me not to go with Cal Peterson um, as, as we've talked about briefly, the Kings really were hoping he would take the reins this year, grab that number one job, have Jonathan Quick as a reliable backup to spell him here and there. Also keep Jonathan Quick, uh, obviously an older player, more fresh and not have to carry the load. And it just didn't happen. Um, you know, it's going to be a, a big season coming up for Cal, but this past season, uh, he wasn't awful, but wasn't what we needed. Wasn't what I think the organization hoped and expected. Um, you know, he has a goals against average closer, way closer to three than you would like a save percentage, uh, like eight ninety save percentage. Those numbers aren't good enough for a, a number one goalie in this league, especially one to backstop a playoff team. So I'd, I'd have to say Cal Peterson, one of my bigger disappointments. Um, uh, but also going forward, one of my biggest questions, is this the year we talk about goalies and defensemen taking a little bit longer to develop? Cal's not old, but he's not young either. You know, we talked about he had the career at Notre Dame. He played college. He's, he's, you know, he's had a lot of hockey. Um, so not necessarily young, but I think it's he's in that he's in that point of his career now where he needs to step up and prove it sooner rather than later. We'll see if it's this year. It wasn't last year. This is the continuing conundrum, I think, for the Kings is what is going to happen in net. Uh, and yeah, it really was supposed to be the year of Cal Peterson. And we just didn't didn't see that. And I feel like that's whenever I talk with hosts from other shows, whenever I talk with other, you know, other hockey people, that's usually one of the number you know, people aren't asking about Drew Doughty anymore. Drew Doughty was usually who I would get the most questions about of like, is he still elite? Is he still a number one defenseman? Like you know, when's that contract and that contract already looks bad, right? Uh, no one really wanted to talk about Drew Doughty this year. Everyone wanted to talk about what's happening in net. And yeah, Cal Peterson definitely did not did not quite hit where uh, where the Kings needed him to hit this season. Uh, for me, when I was looking at kind of the the roster and one, my first kind of thought was a guy that we've talked about previously on the show, which is Alex Iafalo who, you know, is in that first line role, maybe is a little miscast there, uh, yeah. you know, definitely doesn't score at the rate that you would want to see someone on your top line. Uh, but then I went a little further down the list and I think I landed on Tobias Bierenfoot, which is, you know, it's not a hot take, but I feel like people forget about him. Uh, and I mean, first off, he's still, I, I think we forget a little bit that he's still just, he's just 21 years old. Yep. Uh, you know, speaking of, you know, defensemen taking a little longer to develop, uh, he's still very young, uh, maybe got thrust into the NHL a little earlier than he should have been. Uh, but 
you know, they kind of needed, <laughs> they needed someone to play there. Uh, and he was the one that, that fit, but just not progressing at the rate that I would want to see from someone who had his, you know, first full season in the NHL, uh, the season before he played 33 games. Uh, and of course has had a ton of AHL time as well before that uh, with the rain, but just not making the smart reads on plays, just not getting involved the way you want to see him get involved uh, to the point where he was a healthy scratch through the playoff series uh, and towards the end of the season. Like he just wasn't, wasn't getting it, uh, which is frustrating because it's not like coaches have changed. It's not like, you know, his circumstances have changed or anything. It just was not a good season for him. And so he's someone who I hope can bounce back. I know they've invested a lot of, you know, time in him. I'm, I feel like, getting Alex Edler was probably partially for him as a, you know, young Swedish defenseman to have someone like that there to learn from. But I really feel like he took a big step backwards uh, from where he was the season before. Yeah. It's funny you say him because when I was looking at the roster uh, and I was looking at the games play, I'm like, he played 70 games this yeah. year. Yeah. It was such a quiet 70 mm -hmm. games. And I think there's good and bad there uh, when you're a defenseman. If you don't notice a defenseman, mm -hmm. means he, that means he, he could be doing his job defensively, right? He's not mm -hmm. getting beat. Mm -hmm. He's not at a position. But you're also – there's nothing there offensively as well. And he's not Mikey Anderson. Mikey Anderson right. is a shutdown defenseman. We know that's his role. Yeah. We expect more from Tobias Anderson mm – -hmm. or excuse me, from Tobias Bjornfoot. Uh, he, he had no goals and eight yeah. assists in 70 games. Yeah. Uh, I'm not saying he's Drew Doughty or, you know, uh, one of the elite, he, no one's expecting to be an elite defenseman, but I just saw when, when I saw that at 70 games played, I was mm -hmm. like, man, it's yeah. really hard for me to remember a, one game he had mm -hmm. that really stood out. Right. Um, so yeah, yeah. I, I really, he was on my list as well as someone that I think we expect more. more we can, he, there's a lot of guys you can always say, well, he's still young. Mm -hmm. um, he's like you said, he's 21. So there's still time there, but yeah, I, I remember looking at 70 games played and thought, wow, I didn't know he played that many games this year. Yeah. Yeah. And like you said, it'd be way different if he was, you know, your shutdown stay at home defenseman. Um, you know, if he's, you know, especially if you look at like the, the, the peak of his career of like a Rob Scuderi of, yeah, he's not going to score you any goals, but <laughs> he knows his yeah. job. He does it well. Uh, and that's, that's what he's there for. Um, and I know when Bjornfoot was drafted, he wasn't drafted as he was drafted as, you know, kind of shut down, stay at home. Like he wasn't drafted for offense. And you know, they knew that going in part of the reason they drafted him. I know was they just really liked his character. They liked the, his, his leadership abilities, whatever, but you're not going he's not even going to get a chance to show that off if he can't get himself established as, as a, a defenseman on the team. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see what they do with him next season, because I believe he can still go to the rain without needing waivers. So, you know, Sean Dursey obviously should be on the starting net roster. Uh, Jordan Spence did a great job. I could see him fighting for a spot. We've got guys like Jacob Moverari who need waivers to go to Ontario. So do they want to keep him or risk losing him? Uh, it's going to be interesting to see what they do with Bjorn Foot if they send him to the AHL because they have too many other guys who, you know, they, they there's a crunch of, of players who who should be in the NHL and they just don't have enough roster spots. And, and you talked about uh, guys that we want to see more from. It's hard not to mention mm -hmm. Quentin Whitefield. I mean, yeah. I know he's 19. I know he had the knee injury. Uh, but there's so much hype around him, obviously being the, the incredible high pick that he was in the draft. Um, and I'm not panicking yet. I know some people probably are a little bit. They expected to see a little bit more from him. But they, like I said, there's circumstances where you can understand. Mm -hmm. um, but hopefully he gets a full training camp this year and can hit the ground running in this coming season. I, I think there's, there's still so much to see from him now that he's got his feet wet. He's gotten some solid NHL experience, and now hopefully he can get more comfortable uh, and just show his skills that made him, 
you know, such a high draft pick. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're going to have a couple more thoughts on Quentin Byfield. Quentin Byfield uh, coming up next because, yeah, I, I want to stay on him for a minute as well because uh, I know Kings fans have a lot, a lot of thoughts and feelings on Quentin Byfield. But before we do that, I want to remind you that you should be tuning in to Locked On for your NHL draft coverage. The draft is, of course, right around the corner, and our team of local hosts and draft experts are breaking it all down with insights and analysis for, analysis for every first round pick. We don't have to worry about that. Rob Blake got rid of ours. We don't, we don't even have to ha have to focus on that anymore. But if you're a real draft uh, draft aficionado, if you are into that coverage, uh, basically all of our team shows are going to be covering the draft. There's going to be live coverage. Uh, so make sure you are following along. Subscribe to, of course, Locked on Kings. And make sure you're also subscribed to Locked on NHL on YouTube so you can get all the latest breakdowns on the NHL draft and more. So yeah, Quentin Byfield, I, I think when we're thinking about players who we want to see more from, who we have higher expectations for next season, he's definitely up there on my list uh, as, as a player who we know can achieve more than he has. And I think the, uh, you know, I think back to the preseason and watching him throughout the preseason. And I feel like there was a turning point where I was like, kind of iffy, kind of on the border of like, ah, maybe he should start the season in the AHL, whatever. And then there were like the last couple of preseason games he got in. I was like, oh no, he gets it. Like he, he is playing sure they're preseason games and you're not really playing against the best, the best of the best you're playing against, you know, half of the Tucson Roadrunners. But you know, he was, he was making plays that I was like, okay, this is going to work. I want you to start in the NHL. I want you to just start, start there, go with it and see what happens. And then he broke his ankle. Uh, and I feel like, yeah, it's just been a long road back for him. Um, I think, you know, it's obviously not the same injury at all, but I think about uh, the season a couple of years ago where Jeff Carter had that like ankle, like has like tendon severed or whatever. And even he said, like, it took him a couple of years to even feel like he could skate like he was used to, that his body was like ready to play. And of course, obviously much older than Quentin Byfield, but I feel like for for a sport that relies so much on how you can transport yourself from one end of the ice to the other, um, coming back from that kind of injury has to be really rough. But yeah, I, I think a lot of fans are hitting the panic button. I feel like, you know, heading into this draft free agent agency trade Palooza time, like his name keeps coming up and I'm like, no, you're not trading there. There isn't who maybe if Edmonton calls and is like, we'll give you Connor McDavid, like, <laughs> Okay, <laughs> fine. Um, but I, I can't see many trades that would make, like, make sense to just give up on him that is going to not – like Rob Blake is doing a really good job of rebuilding the team but also not, you know, cutting himself off of the, off of the knees. Like even if things don't go well over the next couple of years, the Kings still have the prospects and the draft picks and whatever to – you know, not have to be back in the same hole that they've been in, you know, at, before this rebuild. So there, there's just, it just does, it wouldn't make sense. It wouldn't make sense to trade him. Like you just be patient and he'll figure it out. He's still young. He's still figuring out how everything works. And, you know, it, you're, he, he'll, he'll get there. Just calm down. Yeah. I mean, I, I get it uh, with fans, you know, if you're selected in the top three, Mm -hmm. you're expected to be an impact player. And sometimes that happens and sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes players are still figuring out, you know, Alexi mm -hmm. Lafreniere in New York, yeah. Yeah. right? I mean, we were told that this guy was a generational talent. He was a mm -hmm. game changer. It hasn't happened yet. He's coming along slowly. Um, and we'll see if he eventually gets there or not, but some guys develop quicker than others. Um, and with, I think with, with Quentin Byfield, I think the Kings are taking the long approach on this. I think um, they're they're they want to groom him as the eventual replacement for mm -hmm. Andre Kopitar at some point. That's the, I think that's the big picture. Um, obviously, he, there's a lot of development to go along the way, and there's a lot of learning for him to do along the way. But there's time for him to do that as well. And you know, to have that kind of a talent be a you know a fourth line center, mm -hmm. right? I mean, right. that's that's unbelievable. Um, depth and just a luxury that so many teams don't have. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, you know, there is an argument to be made that maybe he should have started in the AHL. I also like the fact that they had him in the NHL to get him a taste of that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we'll see what he does this year. I, I do expect him to 
be a little bit more dynamic, uh, to be a little bit more offensive. And again, if he is playing on the fourth line, I think we should keep our expectations reasonable there as right. well. But, you know, yeah, I think just to see glimpses, just to see flashes mm-hmm. of the ability that, that had him as such a high draft pick. And, and I'm, I'm still very excited about it. I think it's way, way too premature to talk about him in any kind of trade talks, unless it was something completely uh, unforeseen and out of the blue. And I don't, I just right. don't see that, that yeah. happening. It's kind of a pipe dream. Right. Yeah. That's, it's not as much, as much as I know that, you know, you can go on cap friendly and you can go on the armchair GM and there's always these ridiculous, like Toronto Maple Leafs trade Austin Matthews for, you know, a fourth liner and a pick like, no, like that's not, <laughs> that's not really how it works. Um, but yeah, if Toronto's like, Hey, so we need to move Austin Matthews. I'm like, okay, I'm listening. Tell me yeah, more. Who, do you, who do you want? Who right. You want? But like, yeah, that, that's but those not... trades don't happen. That, that no, just doesn't no, happen. No, definitely not. Um, and I think for me, kind of the last, you know, it's, it's not so much a player that I want to see more from, or that I'm expecting to see better for next season. Uh, but it's, it's in an entire entity called the power play. <laughs> which I I know we've talked about before and it's obviously going to look different once they find out who they're replacing Marco Sturm with, but it's just, there, there is no reason for the power play to be as bad as it has been uh, this season or historically Uh, you look at the players who they have and that you, you shouldn't be as, you know, aggressively mediocre at, at, at it as they are. Um, and I feel like, you know, I, I cover the AHL, so I watched, you know, the whole AHL playoffs, and I'm watching these power plays where the team actually moves around, and they actually get people in the right positions, and you can see the other team not knowing how to respond to it. And it's like, oh, you're allowed to do that. <laughs> you you can't, you don't have to just keep sending things back to Drew Doughty and hoping for the best. Like, mm-hmm. like there's there's better things. So I I I think, you know, if the Kings want to go any further, than they have if they yeah. want to continue uh, to make noise in the playoffs. You know, think of those uh, those Edmonton games where one power play goal could have made a difference, and sure. you know, we didn't have that. So that that is my other pick for a uh, thing that I want to see a lot more from next season. Yeah, we obviously saw the disparity on the power play in the Edmonton series, but I, and I realize we we don't have Kale McCarr or Nathan McKinnon, but the reason the Colorado Avalanche won the Stanley Cup was because of their power play. The reason they beat Tampa Bay was because their power play was so good. Five on five, Tampa was probably the better team. But Mm -hmm. that power play was so unbelievably good that it carried them to a Stanley Cup title. So that just goes to show you how important a power play can be. Uh, And it certainly needs to be better for the Kings, like you said. If they want to go deep into the playoffs, it can't be such a huge disparity one side or the other like we saw in the Edmonton series. Yeah, so... We'll hope or hope for the best on that. I can't wait to see what they do in terms of coaching uh, to see who's going to come in and run that next season, what what it's going to look like. Uh, but it, I, I feel like it, it's so bad that it can only go up from where it's at. <laughs> it would be hard to imagine it being worse. What was it, 27th right. in the league last year? Right. It's possible, but yeah. no, no. I mean, being worse would be they start giving up shorthanded goals in like – every game which i don't even want to like create that idea i don't want to be responsible for that happening but yeah it can't can't possibly get much worse uh than it already is well any final thoughts on great performances lackluster performances uh etc for next season Uh, You know, it's going to be very interesting. I was just thinking about this, uh, you know, going to training camp. We've got our top six set uh, for sure. Um, But there's a couple of those roster spots on the wings, you know, in the third and fourth line. And there's so many different possible answers to those spots. I think training camp is going to be unbelievable. I think the competition level is only going to increase, Uh, you know, the pressure, which can be good. Competition can obviously be very good. And, and I think if you're the Kings, you know, if you're Luke Robitaille or you're Rob Blake or Todd McClellan, you tell these guys, listen, mm-hmm. uh, there are opportunities there, mm-hmm. but there are a lot of people looking to fill those holes. And this is this training camp is a huge opportunity for you guys. Don't sit back and think that it's just going to eventually fall to you. Somebody's going to have to go take mm-hmm. it. And for those yeah. of you that don't, you're going to get left behind. 
So I'm just thinking, uh, you talk about opportunities and seeing more from people. There's, there's, this is going to be a big opportunity for some of those guys to really jump in and show what they've got right away and get off to a good start and try and win one of those uh, winger jobs on the third and the fourth line. Yeah, it is a fun, exciting time for the team. Uh, I, I like that idea of guys need to come in and take it. And if anyone's confused on how to do that, they can just call Blake Lazat because that is what he did yeah. <laughs> joining this team uh, and has not looked back. Uh, so you, you've got a living example right there of a guy who no one thought, no one even knew who he was. Uh, no one thought he was going to make the team, and he's been a mainstay since uh, since his first season. So uh, Kings, Kings players, prospects, uh, you know who to talk to. Uh, that is it for today's episode of Locked on Kings as we uh, break down some of the performances from this past season. Uh, as always, a delight. Eddie, where can folks find you, your work, et cetera, all online? Well, if you want to hear me talk about uh, sports in general, uh, I am on uh, the Fox Sports Radio Network overnights. Uh, locally in Los Angeles, AM 570 LA Sports, starting at 11 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, and if you want to talk to me, uh, get uh, connect with me on Twitter. It's at Eddie on Fox. All right. And you can find me on Twitter at Right Said Sarah. The show's on Twitter at Locked on LA Kings. Uh, we, of course, uh, as we get ready for the draft this week, uh, we'll be uh, talking about that, checking in on who gets drafted by the Kings with all those picks we have in the later rounds, uh, and, of course, keeping up to date with all that stuff. So uh, that is it for today. Thank you so much for listening or watching on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe on YouTube. Hit that notification button so you never miss a future episode. And, of course, tell your friends all about it because it is a fun, exciting time for the Kings, and uh, we're going to cover it. Uh, because that's what we do here on Locked On. This has been Locked On Los Angeles Kings, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.